Good afternoon, everyone. Hope we all had great, great lunch and a good, good MD tour. tour. For those of you, those who, might you who might not remember, my name is Nate Allen. Allen. I'm Assistant, Assistant Professor of Security Studies here at the Africa Center. Really delighted to be back with you this week. Uh, if you remember, I gave the cyber lecture uh, this past week, and I'm here to moderate our session on forging new civil military relations. So as security sector leaders, civil military relations are at the core of what we all do. All strategic decisions that you make are in essence civil military runs and forging successful civil military relationships are key to fostering peace and political instability. Don't believe me? I think we can take the words of the president of Ghana, the very beginning of our seminar saying, peace and freedom walk in tandem. Wherever these three goes, respect follows. This is because citizens, civilian government officials and the uniformed security sector officers are interdependent on one another. And only clear divisions of labor, trust, and accountability between each actor make it possible for security sector officials to protect the people and for governments to meet their needs. Um, you know, as we've also heard, I think both in the sessions on democratization and earlier today, it's no coincidence that, that African, the few African nations who have never experienced a coup or those who have put their history of coups behind them are among the continent's most prosperous and peaceful. As the president of Ghana also said, the reappearance of coups in all its forms and manifestations must be condemned. And that's also, I think, why the rise in unconstitutional changes of government and the recent spike in military coups is so concerning. As sudden, violent, unlawful seizures of power, coups are, at their core, a sign that something is fundamentally broken between civilians, security sector officials, and the societies they serve. And it is in the utmost interest of all of us here today to work together to forge and foster improved civil military relations across the continent. And that's gonna be the main focus of our discussion today is really to talk about what good civil military relations are, what they look like, how to foster them in a democratic context. So the key, the key objectives are define the democratic elements of the governance of the security sector, outline norms, values, and principles, as well as structures, processes, and procedures that underpin democratic civil security sector relations, share success stories and lessons learned that might provide efforts or help efforts to change or reform the security sector. And continuing our discussion from this morning, Talk about the role of leadership in building uh, and respecting institutions that will promote the democratic governance of the security sector. And with us here to talk about that today, we have two excellent, excellent speakers. Um, I have with me directly on my left, uh, Dr. Ibrahim uh, Wani, who is an independent consultant that served as a senior advisor to the Africa Center Strategic Studies Leader Seminar. He also served as a member of faculty and our first academic dean until 2002. Um, he uh, previously, to, he was the Chief of Research and Right to Development Division at the UN Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and served as the Regional Representative for the United Nations Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights in Addis Ababa. He was, prior to his career with us, with the Africa Center, was a Professor of Law at the School of Law at the University of Virginia and the University of Missouri. He also served at the World Bank in several capacities, including as legal counsel at the World Bank sponsored Africa Capacity Building Foundation in Harare, Zimbabwe. Um, he received his Bachelor of Law degree from Makerere University in Uganda, as well as uh, LLM and SJ degrees from the University of Virginia here in the United States. He has been a longtime fixture here at the Africa Center. We also have joining us virtually, uh, Ms. Kemi Okinyoto who is the executive director of the Rule of Law and Empowerment Initiative, known as Partners West Africa Nigeria, a non-governmental organization dedicated to enhancing citizens' participation and improving security governance in Nigeria and West Africa more broadly. She has over 15 years of experience in justice and security sector, sector governance issues in Nigeria and Africa. Um, she is as the team lead of the policing component, of, of Partners West Africa, of the Security Justice Reform Program supported by the UK government. Uh, she provides technical, strategic, and programmatic leadership of the Nigerian Policing Policy Program. 
uh, and uh, which works with policing providers, government and civil society for accountable policing services in Nigeria. From August 2015 to 2016, she provided support to the West Africa Conflict and Security and Stabilization Unit um, in the Northeast. And um, she is a graduate of the Faculty of Law, University of Lagos, and a member of the Nigerian Bar Association, the African Security Sector Network, and the alumni of the Africa Center for Strategic Studies um, and a Secretary General of our Nigeria Alumni Chapter. So two very, very distinguished uh, speakers with a long history of involvement here, at, here with us at the Africa Center. We are going to begin with you, Dr. Wani, and we, we'd ask you to talk about a few, a few key points. So first of all, um, based on your wealth of experience, what is the concept of civil military relations and how has it changed with the evolving nature of Africa's security, security threats and challenges? What is its link to democratic security sector governance in Africa? Um, moreover, the Ibrahim Index of African Governance shows a shrinking trust of citizens in security sector forces. Um, how do you uh, assess these trends and what are the challenges with respect to building a healthy civil military relations, particularly when it comes to the relationship between security forces and their citizens? And then finally, uh, with the surge of coups and increased military intrusion in politics, um, what should African leaders do now in terms of leadership, policy, institutional responses to build healthy civil military relations in Africa? How would security sector reform help with all of this? Good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, Nate, Dr. Nate Allen, thank you very much for that uh, introduction. Let me also thank ACSS for this invitation. Uh, to come here and engage with you this afternoon on a subject that I think is perhaps one of the most critical uh, for us in, uh, in Africa, civil military relations. It's critical because it touches on a whole variety of things, deals with issues of basic security, our security, talks about democratization. It has relationships to questions of socioeconomic development. And I think indeed the future of Africa uh, as a whole. Unfortunately, I have only about 15, 20 minutes rather, actually 15 to 20 minutes to talk about all of this. So I don't think I'm going to be able to do justice to uh, the topics that uh, I've been assigned to discuss. And I'm certainly not going to try to get too detailed in talking about each one of them, not only because uh, we will really not have enough time but also because I believe that the longer you talk, the more dangerous it gets because there's only so much wisdom and, and fact you can relate to. And I don't want us to get into a situation where you begin to debate all of the wrong things that I have said. Uh, so what I thought I might do is just very, very briefly start with a, a conversation about the concept of civil military relations. Just give you the basics of what it actually means. I know you've talked about it already and you probably have a sense of it, but it would be good to always go back and revisit and say, what is it that we're talking about when we talk about civil military relations? It's really not, not that self-evident. And then I will go and look at uh, the state of military relations in Africa. Again, with a disclaimer here that when you're talking about 54 countries with so many histories, so many differences, it is always very risky to begin to talk about something in Africa. We're so different. Yes, there's a lot of commonality, but particularly in this area also, you will see that the trends and developments and challenges and context vary quite a lot. So what I'll do there is highlight a few key directions where things are going uh, with the intention of really framing issues for us to discuss. And then I'll conclude with some observations on the, uh, the, the, the key issues of transformation, because my sense, my conclusion, looking at the whole state of civil military relations in Africa is that we really do need some fundamental rethink. We need to think about how we think about security. We need to think about how we operationalize security for a whole lot of reasons, including some of what uh, he referred to here. So very briefly, what do we mean by civil military relations? Uh, I will take uh, as a starting point, the definition in your syllabus. It says that civil military relations is the manner in which the military interacts with society. It is a negotiated bargain between citizens, civilian government authorities, and the military. I think it's important for us to take that into account that the three key stakeholders in security are the military or security sector in general, 
society as a whole, citizens, we do have a stake in security as well, and of course the civilian government as a representative. So what civil military relations deals with is the respective roles and responsibilities of these three segments of uh, stakeholders in the security sector, the military, of course, the government and the population, uh, what are their responsibilities? How do they engage with each other uh, in the management of the security uh, of a country? The key idea, at least as developed in Western democracies behind civil military relations is that of civilian control of the military. The proposition behind the idea of civilian control of the military is that uh, the elected representatives of the people are responsible for making the key strategic decisions about security. What is the security threat? How do we envision it? What institutions should be dealing with, uh, with uh, security? What kinds of mechanisms do we need to put in place to deal with our security? What is the strategy with respect to security? What is the composition of the security sector? The appointments of senior officials and so on and so on. All of the key strategic policy decisions to be made by the civilian component. The role of the military is very, very specifically, of the security sector rather, is very, very specifically defined. It is to give advice to the civilian authorities in the formulation of those strategies and policies. And once decisions have been made and they've been given their guidance to execute. A key point here is that the military sector, the security sector, should not be involved in political decision making. Again, its role is advice and execution implementation, should not be involved in political uh, decision making. The US is often cited as the classical uh, example of civilian control of the military, where I think uh, most people would agree that the military uh, infrastructure in general accept it as a given that the civilians, Congress is the one that makes some of the key decisions uh, with respect to all of the key uh, issues and that the military focuses on developing and applying their functional military expertise. Congress deals with issues of policy, approves the commands, it approves the budget for the military, it deals with issues of deployment, promotion and appointment, uh, and so on and so on. I, I leave it there just so that we don't get into the weeds because if you really unpack it, civil military relations gets extremely complex. There are a whole lot of issues uh, that uh, one deals with here. Where do you draw the line in this division of labor between policy strategic issues on the one hand and issues of operations? Uh, when does civilian control become micromanagement? What if the advice of the military is not taken? by the civilians and they take the wrong decision or even if they begin to micromanage and risk, at least in the perspective of the military, the security of the country. Uh, what if the legitimacy of the civilian government itself is questioned? Uh, the military also has the right to make some judgment, isn't it, about uh, the political sector? What if that is questioned? Uh, there are also debates about competence and motivation. In many, many instances, some of the questions people raise is, uh, these guys are really not expert. As, As a military officer, from the moment of your recruitment through the ranks, you go through extensive training about the art of, of security. You deal with issues of security strategy. You deal with every aspect. How can you be subservient to a civilian whose loyalty may even be questionable? In some cases, they argue that uh, the civilian political leaders are more driven by politics. They are wishy-washy. They are really not loyal to the constitution or to the country. How can an establishment whose business is the protection of this country be subordinate to them and listen to what advice uh, they are uh, giving and whatever direction? And what if they go wrong? What is your role? Do you have a responsibility? So there are a whole lot of questions in civil military relations. It gets a lot more complex. But I think what I want us to live with here is simply this idea of the division of labor, the role of the military or the security sector circumscribed. It is advice, execution, implementation, 
all the other issues, the key strategic decisions. Of course, there is an interplay as, as uh, practitioners in this field have often argued that in practice, it's a lot more of a give and take uh, across, across the board. Now, before I talk about uh, uh, civil military relations in Africa, I'd like to take a few minutes to talk about the mechanisms of control because it's, it's easier to, to mention it uh, in passing like this, but how do we exactly undertake that control of uh, 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 the security of the military? There are three primary uh, sets of mechanisms. The first is institutional formal mechanisms. This includes the constitution, the laws in a country, including the uh, National Defense Act. In some cases, you might have the, the, the statute that establishes uh, the, the, the military uh, itself. Some countries have national security councils. In parliament, you will have defense committees that deal with the issues of budgets. Uh, they have jurisdiction over policies and budgets. There are public accounts committees, service regulations. There are regulations dealing with the promotion processes. Uh, and of course, in many, many countries, you have a Ministry of defense. That would be the key entry point for the management of the security sector. The second mechanism is through monitoring and oversight. Once that mandate has been delegated, there are then processes through which the uh, civilian component keeps track of what is going on in the security sector. Are they doing the right things? Are they following directives? Uh, these are done through audit committees, through investigations, uh, parliamentary committees. And here is where you bring in some other stakeholders, the media and think tanks and part of uh, parcel of that monitoring uh, and oversight. And of course the legislature has a key role and the judiciary as well. And then the last aspect of, uh, uh, of control deals with the professional norms and standards uh, that every military officer, I presume, would have to go through from the time of dealing with their recruitment, with education, with training, promotion, uh, and so on. Ideally, those should inculcate into you the issues of transparency, of accountability, of subservient to, uh, to civilian authority, and of course, uh, what is your responsibility? What are you loyal to? What is security? What are you defending? Is your loyalty to the government in power or is it to some other entity, to the constitution uh, and uh, to the people uh, of, 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 a, of a country? Now, let me uh, shift gears a little bit and talk about the state of civil military relations in Africa. As I said at the beginning, I am not going to try to give you case studies. I'm just going to be a very, give you a very broad overview. Uh, I suspect that some of you will find things that you agree with in what I say. Some may disagree with me vehemently, but that's not the point. The point of doing this is simply for us to think through where we are. Uh, the situation is going to vary very much from country uh, to country. Uh, I think as a general proposition, one can state here that there has been significant changes in civil military relations in Africa. From about the time of independence through the 1980s until the mid 1990s, most of us were under military government or one party states that depended very much on the military for the execution of their powers and for control of society. Uh, there was very little debate about the other stakeholders getting involved in civilian government didn't have any role at all. And of course the public did not have much of a say uh, in that. Beginning in the 1990s, we shifted ground we moved away from military governments towards democratic uh, governance. And both within countries, as well as uh, at the level of the region and sub-region, uh, we embraced democracy as a mode of going. And, and at that point on, there has also been a shift in uh, civil military relations in our uh, respective countries. Perhaps significant to note here, the African Charter on democracy, elections, and governance, which was adopted by the AU in 2007, which I'm sure you've uh, heard of uh, before, and we'll be talking about for perhaps in a, a bit more detail later, later on, which, which first, first of all, all uh, underscored the commitment to the universal values and principle of democracy, good governance, and human rights in Africa. It uh, uh, spoke in favor of the culture of the regular change of power based on regular, free, free fair, and transparent elections. It rejected the unconstitutional changes of government uh, and noted that the unconstitutional change of government causes insecurity uh, in the continent. Uh, it's a cause of its instability and leads to violent conflicts. And, and it, pro uh, it, it prohibited, prohibited and rejected unconstitutional changes of government, which 
was, was defined, defined not, not, to include not only the military taking over, but also unconstitutional changes. Manipulation of the constitution was considered unconstitutional. So that is a normative premise upon which I think the trend in uh, civil military relations has been over the last few years. Uh, but of course, the way it has applied in practice has varied very much from country to country. And let me just very briefly say that there are probably some seven or eight different models that apply across the continent. Uh, one are the countries that have adopted democratic civil military relations in the classical sense of the word. Very few of those, Senegal, Ghana, I promised I will not mention countries here and I'll not go too much into that except the good ones. Uh, uh, Senegal, Ghana, a couple of other countries, unfortunately the list is very small, have adopted democratic civil military government uh, relations where uh, the military sector, professional, stays out of politics, policies and issues that are decisions are made by uh, the civilian uh, sector. There is closely related to that, and I'm, I'm running through that very, very quickly. I'm sorry, we can get back to questions later on if you have any. Uh, that there is a, what is also referred to as objective displacement model, where there is professionalism. The military appears to be professional, but in reality is being dictated uh, usually by uh, a political leader. And what you'll find here is that political authority is exercised through personal networks. And, and usually it would be the president uh, responsible for making the key decisions as opposed to democratic institutions more generally. We also have uh, the example of uh, former countries that uh, fought liberation wars. Many, many of them here, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Namibia, Angola, and so on, where uh, the history of the struggle itself created a very unique dynamic where there was a very, very close symbiotic relationship between the, 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 the military leaders and uh, the political leadership. And uh, you, you end up in a situation where uh, the distinction is not that clearly drawn. And in fact, in a number of these countries, you ended up with former guerrilla leaders and military leaders serving as cabinet members uh, and, and, and so on. That's probably closer to the reality across a lot of the countries. Uh, and then you have the developmental military. Countries like Rwanda, Uganda, Ethiopia have been cited in this instance where uh, also very close to the case of the liberation movement, they were engaged in uh, a liberation struggle, in freedom struggles, and see the role of the military very much from a developmental perspective, and don't draw a distinction separating the military from the political processes. Uh, and then we have post-conflict states, Sierra Leone, Liberia, Gambia, not necessarily exactly a post-conflict state in that sense, but rather one where there's been significant uh, shifts in the way that the security sector is dealt with. And here, uh, I think a classical notion of structural uh, security sector reform has applied in all of these cases. In the case of Liberia, for example, the military was dissolved entirely, and you ended up beginning to reconstitute a security sector, uh, presumably with some of the ethos that are promoted through the security sector reform uh, agenda, which is moved primarily by the UN and development partners. Uh, and then uh, you, you have the failed state cases, South Sudan, Central African Republic, and a couple of others where you, you, you really don't have organized institutions as such. There are so many uh, movements fighting each other. You see that in the DRC even today, M23 challenging the government and so on, where it is very, very difficult to talk about a, a coherent system of civil military uh, relations. Uh, and then I'll just mention here last cases where the military is back in power, Sudan, Burkina Faso, uh, Guinea, Mali, uh, and so on, where we've gone full circle. In the case of Sudan, in fact, they had they left the, the group for just a few months and went back where, again, uh, they are controlling uh, every, everything in this regard. So my sense of the whole situation here, having given this very broad scan, is that uh, uh, we have not really moved that far in developing democratic civil military relations if you scan across the continent. The very, very few democracies that have tried to do so, according to the Economic Intelligence Unit, most recent survey, we are backsliding a lot uh, on democracy. Uh, the, the Economic Intelligence Unit also pointed out that, in fact, nearly 45% of African countries could be categorized as authoritarian. And that comes along with a much uh, a fusion of the relationship between the military and the, uh, the, the, the civilian uh, component. Having said that, I think that the general proposition 
of civilian control of the military is fully accepted and underscored in, uh, in the continent. Even in those countries that depart, they would not challenge that proposition. And uh, it is done not only from the point of view of democratic theory. Uh, it is the security of the people. They have the sovereign authority. They make those key decisions. The military is an agent. It is representative and therefore it has to comply, but also from an instrumental point of view. And I think this was the point that uh, Dr. Allen was referring to earlier here, that studies of civil military relations more generally show that democratic reforms and control mechanisms produce more professional, trusted and effective security forces. We can debate that proposition, but this is a key element that is uh, made here. So, I know that I've probably run out of time now. Let me conclude very, very quickly with a, a few areas where I think that the debate about transforming civil military relations can focus. Again, it depends very much on a situation in a country because all of us countries vary significantly. Uh, some of you may have to start at different things, but let me point to about seven things. One is that we need to revisit our conception of security. Whose security? What do we mean by security? What is involved in it? This is one of the key agenda items in the security sector reform. And in the countries that have done it, it has been quite revealing to talk to people across the country and to hear their perspectives about what they think security is about. Uh, you will hear people talk a lot about health, about education, about their own safety at home, about criminality. They'll talk about jobs for their children uh, and so on. A very, very different kind of dynamic. And if you're thinking about building a consensus about security across a country, I think it's important that we start from there so that uh, we all have a common understanding. Uh, secondly, then you need to think about what kind of security institutions and establishments you would need to put in place to, this, to deal with these security issues. Because you cannot have a mismatch. We have a situation now where all of our, most of our challenges lead in one direction, but we have security instrumentalities that lead us in another direction altogether. There's a total mismatch between our threats, our goals, and the security infrastructure. And therefore, the immense investment that we have in the security sector does, does not really deal adequately uh, enough with the kinds of challenges that we have in society. And so we need to think about the kind of institutions and establishments that we need. Thirdly, there has to be a clear understanding and clarity on the mission the role and responsibilities of the security sector. What is it that we have in mind when we're talking about the security sector? What is their role? And it has to be delimited uh, in, some, in some respect. And one of the risks that most of our countries face now is a situation where the military, the security sector is more and more drawn into local policing issues, into electoral contests uh, and so on and so on until so we end up with very bad situations where you have human rights violations, physical abuse of communities, and so on and so on, and weaken a weakened security sector, uh, in fact, at the, at, at the same time. So we need to revisit this discussion about, uh, about uh, the mission and role. And then, uh, fourthly, uh, composition. What sort of, who, who is in the military? Uh, unfortunately, in many, many of our countries, we have what is referred to as stacking where as a form of coup proofing, if you will, many countries, many leaders go to their ethnic areas and to their regions to recruit from there. The senior officer corps tends to come primarily from this area. Uh, and as a result, uh, you don't have really, really a national outlook within the security sector. And that's extremely dangerous. Those who have studied coups, in fact, suggest that uh, if you look at the relationship here, there seems to be a very close correlation between the composition of the military and, and the kinds of security stability and environment that uh, we have. Fifth, issues of accountability, transparency, and the key values that ought to be drive the military ought to be center stage and need to be uh, dealt with. And in this regard, I think that we need to demystify the notion of security a little bit. Part of the problem we run into now with uh, civil control of the military is that even where we have legislatures, reports indicate that they are either scared afraid or timid about any kind of oversight of the security sector. It's a combination of things, either because they don't feel capable enough and competent to do so, or because in fact, there's still an atmosphere of fear 
uh, in the society. And we need to get uh, beyond that. Six values are extremely important. The values of professionalism, the ethos of civilian civil control of the military, of subordination need to be underscored. And finally, I think one would be remiss if one didn't mention the whole process and uh, environment of democratization, the rule of law and human rights. Most of what we have talked about here are feasible only to the extent that we are moving in the right direction, the democratic trend, that we do emphasize respect uh, for human rights, that the rule of law governs our relationship, because otherwise all of the infrastructure you build will be uh, meaningless. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wani, for, for that uh, absolutely masterful overview of civil military relations in Africa. I think two key things I want to highlight. Number one, the definition he gave as, of, of, as um, the manner in which the military governs society in relationship to civilians. That's really, really important. Oftentimes, even civil military relations experts uh, do not have the civilian focus or the, the societal focus when it comes to civil military relations. And I think having that lens can, as Dr. Wani said, add an awful lot to our understanding of how far Africa, African civil military relations have come and how far there still is to go. I mean, as Dr. Wani mentioned, I think the idea of military governance is pretty widely discredited. Even, even today, there are only three or four actual military governments in Africa. Even then, even though you have a very, very few fully kind of democratic, classically civil military relations, uh, democratic, classic democratic civil military relations and only select few of regimes, I think many, as Dr. Wani nicely point out, many regimes are kind of in this middle. They're, they're objectively displaced. They're, they're post-liberation wars. They're, they're post-conflict. Some of them are failed states. And I think the big question, as, as Dr. Wani posed, is what should civil military relations in these countries look like in order to get to a place where there is more uh, clear roles and responsibilities, more respect, more stability um, in these societies. And I think bringing this idea that civil military relations needs to respect citizen security and taking into account the conception of security, the institutions, the mission, the composition, the accountability, and the values of security forces, that's critical. That's what we want to be talking about. Um, and that's, that's what I think uh, if we're gonna forge a new concept of civil military relations in, Af in Africa, those are the kinds of things we need to discuss. Um, and I think to help us pick up on that conversation, we're gonna hear from Dr. Kemi uh, Alkino, from Mrs. Kemi Alkino on her experience, I think, dealing with some of these issues in the context of policing and police reform in Nigeria. Um, because remember, uh, the police are also a really, really important part of the security sector, especially when it comes to managing internal conflict. So I think we need to we need to take a broader view than just civil military relations. We're talking about civil security sector relations. So Kemi, let's let's hear based on Nigeria how the concept of civil security sector relations has changed given the evolving nature of Nigeria's security security sector threats. How does this link to democratic governance in Nigeria? Um, based on your work with the police service, how do you assess the status and trends of civilian police relationships within Nigeria? And what are the challenges for building these healthy uh, relationships? And then uh, finally, based off of your wealth of experience engaging uh, civilians as part of, uh, in, in concert with police services, what are some lessons learned that can help our colleagues here improve civilian police and, and therefore civilian security sector relations, particularly when it comes to matters of security sector reforms? What can all the leaders in this room in Africa and elsewhere do to create an environment that is conducive to a healthy um, you know, CMR, as I think, according to a lot of the criteria that I think Dr. Wani so expertly laid out before us? So, uh, Kemi, the floor is yours. Um, and thanks for having me. Um... First, I'll say that um, for us, for what I've seen over time, working on this concept of issue, um, this concept of civil military relationship, particularly when it looks at um, the police and policing structure in country, is to say that um, one of the first place to start is, or one of the places place we started from, is looking at oversight mechanisms that are civilian in nature. Um, taking the responsibility of oversight or accountability of either the police or the defense and security um, sector. Um, and then 
over time with the spate of um, insecurity, conflict, and uh, criminality that have spread across the country, um, we keep asking ourselves, what's the role of the police and other law enforcement and security agencies? Can they do this thing alone? And one of the feedback we get all the time is that they can't do it alone. So Nigeria, for example, has a police force that is over 300,000 um, manpower. And the over 300,000 manpower is not enough to be spread across the country. And we have seen activities of non-state policing or security actors that have evolved. Let me quickly state here that it's not all the non-state security actors that one would give, um, would give a pass mark or a credible mark to. But we found um, the face of some of them that have evolved over time and engage in a practical and um, in a practical manner with the law enforcement and security actors. So for example, um, in the Northeast, we have the activities of the Civilian Joint Task Force, the CJTF. The CJTF worked very closely with the Joint Task Force set up by the Defense Headquarters, which was a military operation, um, in trying to identify and be part of the operations in the in of um, the operations in the northeast. Then we have also the voluntary policing groups that have evolved across different states. And you've seen states and mechanisms try to evolve this voluntary policing groups or even codifying them or giving them credibility under the um, legal framework or policy framework. One of such is what we have in Enugu State. So the, in Enugu State under the Human Capital Development Ministry, you find the voluntary policing group or the neighborhood watch group is set up in such a way that it is looked at um, per household. So they took a census, they have an, an idea of the number of households or dwelling places. So it's, I think over each 10 or 15 or 20 has a structure in place. This structure in place is not outside what the police within the jurisdiction, the police within the jurisdiction have an idea that these structures are there and they have an idea of how the recruitment takes place. They are also at times involved in the vetting of some of the members so that they ensure that people with that have criminal records are not don't do not find their way into these groups. And then the operational manual or the operational procedure for some of these groups are also and they also try to, we also, they also find them in alliance with the police um, process. So even in the FCT here, and I'm taking pockets of um, examples, even in the FCT here, you find that maybe in, a, in an area within the municipal, and I'll use Garki as an example, Garki is an area within the federal capital territory. Within the Garki area, you have residential, you have commercial. Yeah. And, you, and commercial is organized private sector, the banks are there, and you also have the markets. So within the markets, there are structures within the market, security structures within the markets that have been put in place. These structures are known to the um, divisional headquarters, the police divisional headquarters that oversees Garki. Same with the neighborhood watch groups that have been put in place also within Garki, because it's a combination of middle class and low income earning area. So you have some with, particularly with the, within the low income earning area, you have voluntary policing groups that have been put in place. These voluntary policing groups are known to the division, divisional headquarters in Garki. And when they have to come out on operations, which means when they come out in the evenings and they are patrolling, they need to register at the police station that these are the people patrolling this area to this area. And so they know them. If anything happens, one of the first things the divisional police officer will do is to call the team within the voluntary policing group team that is on duty or the leadership to find out if they are aware of any um, breakdown of law and order 
and if they have responded to it. At times, if there has been a breakdown of law and order, one of the things the police will do is to liaise with these groups and get them to fish out the culprit. Because we say that these culprits live in our midst and they are not spirits. They are known to people within the community. However, because of the formalized nature of the formal security apparatus, they might not be able to engage at the grassroots level effectively to gain the trust of the people so that the information they need is readily available to them. Um, when we talk about human rights violations and we talk about accountability mechanisms, and at times some colleagues raise the uh, human rights violations of these non-state um, policing actors and the fact that the, their non-adherence to the principles of rule of law. My school of thought is, is the same thing we're grappling with, with the formal agencies. So if we're grappling with the same thing with the formal agencies, how do we extend uh, our technical expertise or extend the process to them such that you won't help you what they are assisted in being more organized and more structured, and then they can play a more impactful role. Areas of collaboration, I, I've, I've mentioned some areas of collaboration. And when we talk about the issues of lack of trust between the police and the citizens, um, there are three schools, I always say there are about three schools of, of um, thoughts on this, which fuels which we also say is also the basis for the evolution or the, yes, the evolution of this non-state security apparatus. And um, one of it is that the formal security agencies are not really doing what they ought to do. They do not have the capacity or they do not have the capability um, to work effectively. Another school of thought is that these are the structures that have been with us, traditional structures that have been with us over time. Um, we want to wish them away, but we cannot wish them away. So they keep evolving, even as the even as the laws, the laws and the frameworks and the policies we're involving for our security sector outlines them or does not take cognizance of them. It doesn't wish them away. They are there. And my thought, the third school of thought is that they're, they're a combination of these two. They're a combination of the two, and we are in a process whereby they need to work together. My school of thought is based on the third one, that they are, we are in this together, and we need to work together. Um, thirdly, um, the evolution, as we say, as we say it is, the evolution as we say it is, um, is something that even though it has grown, we've also seen processes whereby laws, rules, regulations have evolved to have them in place. Um, when police, sorry, I'm trying to begin my talk the bit here. When we say police lose trust with citizens, it could also be that police are a reflection of the government. So the people, it's a social contract thing. The people do not trust the government. The police is the face of the government. So that mistrust from government is extended to the people, is extended to the police. Then the police couple it with high handedness, low level corruption, lack of efficiency, and effectiveness and carrying out their duty. Now, now, so it becomes a combined, a com a combined um, issue. Uh, the social contract is wrong. Then the agency of government that is engaging with the citizens is also having its own challenges. Then we look when we look at it this way. Then we ask, how do you? play it around, how can it be, how can the police be in a better place become with the citizens? So it is trying as much as possible to have policies in place 
to have a legal framework that drives reform. And I stand corrected with experience for us over here. Now we have policies in place. Now we have legal frameworks that drive reform, that have institutionalized reform. However, we still grapple with the same, most of the same challenges. And then you, the, we come to the issue of the governance structure and politicization of, the, of our law enforcement and security organizations. Why have we, why we continue to have a law enforcement and security apparatus that is heavily political? that the political interference in their day-to-day -day operations, including recruitment, including posting, including how they carry out their, their mandates, including what they respond to and how they respond to the issues. So the legal framework, the reform in the legal framework, yes, good, but not substantial. The reform in the operational policies, yes, good, but not substantial. So it looks, it, it's becoming more apparent that on, maybe until we get our governance structure right, until we get our, our democratic process right, we might not be able to get, we might not get the kind of law enforcement and security institutions that we so desire. And I'm rounding up now that what lessons have we learned? What, yeah, that what should be the takeaway that, um, African leaders should be looking at. One is depoliticiz depoliticization of our security organizations and even depoliticization of security in general in Africa. Um, the first speaker, Dr. Ibrahim spoke about demystifying security. We really need to demystify security. And a lot of times when you're talking security, we think it's within the purview of just the law enforcement and security officials. And even within the law enforcement and security organizations, there is the innate rivalry and the hierarchy um, tough. The army would go above the, the air force or the navy, the police would come last, then other paramilitary structures would, um, would follow suit. A whole of government approach to security is where we ought to be, is what we ought to be talking about. Most of the root causes of the challenges that we have, that we that we that of the security challenges we have, and at least I can speak for Nigeria, which I think mirrors some of the other countries in Africa, are not security based. They are driven by bad governance. So you're talking about impunity. You're talking this disregard for rule of law. Disregard you're you're having a system that is not an inclusive system. Once somebody from a particular sector, section of the gov of the country comes into power, then it looks like it's room for everybody from that side of the country, no matter how incompetent you are, to hold a, a, a portfolio. And um, then you, we look at um, accountability and transparency. Accountability and transparency across board accountability and transparency in the recruitment process, accountability and transparency in the appointment process, accountability and transparency in the board, in the fiscal account, in the fiscal accountability processes. We see a situation whereby um, a lot of things have been securitized. So you are asking, even the monies that is being voted into security, how is it how is it being expended, and how do you do this vis-a-vis -vis other other sector of other parts of government? So, like I re-emphasize, a whole of government approach is the right way to addressing um, security challenges and in bringing robust civil military relationship into the continent. And finally, strengthening us oversight and trans uh, uh, accountability and oversight mechanisms. Accountability and oversight mechanisms in governance and which would translate into the security sector, not just accountability and oversight mechanisms of the security sector without looking at the governance sector. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, Kemi, for that excellent talk, I think, you know, it, it's clear that one key challenge that a lot of African countries face are security forces that are in part because of institutional design issues, you know, national gendarmeries, 
um, national police forces don't necessarily have the capacity uh, to effectively provide security and aren't necessarily trusted by their citizens. Say, like in Nigeria's case, they aren't adequately representative. Uh, local police units are not, they're nationally recruited, might not necessarily be reflective of the areas they're supposed to police. Um, and it's incumbent upon, as, as Kemi said, I think security forces in those areas to try to work collaboratively with uh, auto defense groups, with like the civilian joint task forces in Nigeria, voluntary policing groups, to try to get at solutions that enable security forces to more effectively provide for their citizens. And I think as, as Kemi said, right, um, part of this this fostering trust requires some degree of openness, transparency, and accountability uh, between uh, governments and citizens, between security forces and citizens, which I think, as both speakers have highlighted, can be very, very difficult um, in societies that do not have a stable social contract, do not have a stable overarching government framework in place that allows them to, prov to provide for security effectively. So.